Hello, everybody. This is the little Sunday uh, meeting I do at Bethany. And I like doing the ones uh, Sundays. It's just unprepared. But you could see uh, pretty much a lot of the verses and the ones that I'm kind of doing, Galatians and all the studies. Uh, everything is pretty much consistent. Now, today I did listen to the... Uh, Mass on the radio, and there were some of the verses that were like the Christmas verses. They talked about the epiphany and what epiphany means, and that just the term itself. Sometimes you have moments in life where, like, that's a moment where, like, you know, oh, God spoke to me, or God did something, or uh, a supernatural event, possibly. And so I might mention a few of that. Uh, I went to Corpus Christi Christian Fellowship, and I might uh, just quote a few of the verses Pastor Don had spoke on. I guess you could say the outline of the theme would have been uh, what the scripture uh, that talks about when it talks about hope. Maybe I'll quote a few of the verses that Don shared, and uh, then we'll see what Bethany because I did not look at the outline and I t from uh, Church Unlimited, and she went today to Church Unlimited. So we'll start with, maybe I'll have Bethany read a few. Oh, do I have any jokes? Well, I'll start with this one. I give a dollar away just about every day. A few months ago, over the years, I used to help just people if I had money, but my retirement check is a direct deposit. So for a while, I, you know, don't, I don't have cash. I'd, basically just have my direct deposit. And whenever I had money over the years on me, sometimes I would like be bad with it because I would give it. I was going to give somebody a little bit once and I had a larger bill on me and I said, oh, I'll, I just, just gave him like the whole bigger bill. So I, a few months ago, I made it a point. I said, you know, I'm going to take $35, $1 bills every month which means I'd actually have to go into my bank and then make the withdrawal and say I want one dollar bills and which is okay. I just made a commitment. I said, you know, let me just do that just for the sake of giving away a dollar a day, which isn't much. And you say, John, but most of the friends that get the dollar, they're going to buy alcohol. Those guys, believe it or not, many of them get lots of lots of money sometimes when they. People hand them money, sometimes 50, 100, you know, over a period of a day or whatever. Those are some of the people you see that we call fly the signs, meaning they're under the overpasses asking for handouts. So the $1 that they get from me is like a drop in the bucket, to be honest. But they're starting to get used to it, which is okay, because they'll ask me, John, did you give that $1? And sometimes I'll say, yes, I actually gave it to one of the ladies, which I do, because I want to give it. If there's a lady on the streets and there are some, I feel it does better. But then they don't get mad. Like, And then I'll say, I gave it to this one. And uh, then the other one will say, oh, they beat me to it. But then the other day I gave it to somebody, but he just worked. He made about $40 actually working that day. And the other guy showed up and said, Oh, so you get John's dollar, and the other guy gave it to the other guy. So they're learning a little bit. But one day I showed up last week, and I said, uh, they said, Do you have, uh, did you give your dollar away? And I said, no. I said, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I said, you guys didn't tell me. They said, why? I said, I noticed as I've been given a dollar away a day, at the end of the month I have less dollars. And, of course, they were laughing. Because, you know, it's going to cost a little money. So that was the little thing. All right, Bethany, what were some of the verses from? Well, he kind of did like more of a history. So also used other books too. Oh. Other than just the Bible. But it says Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He started with this one. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, oh, what is this, good. This is one I quote. I'll just quote Say King it? James. Uh -huh. He hath shown thee. This is like one of my key quote verses. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requ requires of thee, how to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. 
And I quote that a lot, and that's, I just finished teaching a little bit on Micah about a month ago. So, okay. And then the next one was just, he brought back to like talking about Genesis, how it says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, talking about Abraham's descendants. Oh, now you weren't there on my last quoting, were you? At Becky's? I yes, you, well, yeah. I quoted that one. Uh -huh. You don't remember? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so all, kind of... all people will be blessed through the seed. Was that the Genesis 12 mm -hmm. that he uh, used? Chapter 3. Uh, or verse, chapter verse 12, three. verse 3. And yes. And the next one was Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So oh, so like that's really that what I was... Old Testament and New Testament both mention... Much of what we discussed on the last video that you were in with Becky, because the promise to Abraham was through one of your kids, through thy seed, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Paul, in the book of Galatians, will quote that and say, God saith not to seeds as of many, but to thy seed as of one which is Christ. So Paul the Apostle, who is familiar with the Jewish teaching because he was a Pharisee. He remembered that story because they had the Old Testament, the Pharisees. They were the teachers of the Jewish law. So when Paul quoted that, he was saying, God promised through the one seed and the one from uh, Matthew, the genealogy, it's, that's showing you how Jesus came through that lineage because ultimately that promise goes through David. It's going to be the son of David and Christ comes all the way through these promises. So that was much of what I was teaching in the video. Mm -hmm. So it kind of tied it all in. And then he does Psalms, chapter 16, verse 10. Um, he starts off with, the, probably in the middle of a sentence, but because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Something about okay. dying. Because thou wilt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Now this is a psalm that's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because Peter, in the very famous sermon in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. He's preaching that Jesus would not stay in the grave and rot, but God would raise him from the dead. And Peter quotes this. And Peter, when he's quoting these verses, I believe it's this one, but this is the famous sermon in Acts 2. Most of us are familiar with Acts 2 because it's the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But then Peter, as he gives the message, he'll quote things from David and from the Psalms and says, now, what about that time where this Psalm said, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption? Basically meaning you're not going to let him stay in the grave. And, but then when Peter interprets this, the Apostle Peter, and other verses as well, he says, how could David have been talking about himself? If, if I made a promise to somebody, and if I was God, and I made a promise to somebody, and here's the promise, I promise you, you will never rot in the grave. And then you hear me say that. The Psalms were also like songs and all. So you hear me going around saying, oh, I will never rot in the grave. I will never rot in the grave. And then someday I die. And you say, wait a minute. John's tomb is with us. It's here. It's down. He's buried. I want to be buried actually in the Fairview Cemetery because that's where I grew up. But you could say, wait a minute. What was that nut talking about that he'll never be permanently in the grave? And when Peter quotes this, he says, David was not talking about himself because his grave is with us till this day. But because he was a prophet and the Spirit was speaking through him, Peter says, this verse is talking about Jesus. And Peter's kind of rough in these messages. He says, who you took him and you killed him and you crucified the Lord of glory. God raised him from the dead and fulfilled that verse. And so this is how we interpret because that's in the book of Acts, Acts 2, and the New Testament apostles, how they begin interpreting all of these Old Testament verses and prophecies, that's how we get our understanding. 
Now, this is going to be important for my next chapter in Galatians, because though I don't want to talk about political things when I do my Galatians, it's very important that we as Christians today, this could fit with some of the verses I might quote that Pastor Don used, but it's very important that we understand as Christians Many of these verses about God promising the land to Abraham and ultimately Israel and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what a famous city it is. But Jesus will say in the New Testament, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone those that ascend unto thee. How often I would have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks and you would not. So now you're finding in Jesus and in the New Testament writers, Paul and others, there's not this affinity for the old city of Jerusalem, which is referred to as natural Jerusalem. It's not like they were interpreting these verses as a land fulfillment. As in today, right now, there's some debate going on in world politics, and it's very serious debate. And the debate has to do with I mentioned it on one of the other videos, but it was a, re a recent UN vote. And in the past, there were many nations at, that are represented at the UN. Okay, and in the past, there were two countries that would, uh, nations that would always veto a particular vote. And the vote was um, about whether Israel, the Jewish nation itself, is illegally occupying Palestinian territories. And it goes back to the war that took place in 60-something, uh, I believe. But there was a particular time where Israel and the Palestinians had a war, and Israel won, and they took some territory. Okay. Now, many Christians and some politicians go back to these old promises where God said that Jerusalem is... God's special place, the city and capital will be there. And they actually are making decisions. Many prophecy teachers uh, teach it that that land, that physical city, it belongs to a particular nation today. And if we have to go to war to defend that nation, to have it. But none of the prophets or apostles of the New Testament interpret any of those Old Testament prophecies in that way. Okay? And I just quoted one from Jesus where he spoke and said, Oh, Jerusalem, talking about natural Israel at the time, you're killing the prophets, you're stoning those that are sent unto you. And Jesus himself is the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophets. So in the New Testament, natural Israel is not looked at upon as a, Oh, what a wonderful, great thing. It's always in a negative connotation in the sense Jerusalem which is below, this is also in Galatians, represents the city that's in bondage. This is how it's taught. Not talking about whose side we're on, but when Paul uses those types of uh, words, he's saying those who reject Jesus, those who reject the Messiah. Now this is going to probably get into what Bill was talking about somewhat. With, did he cover the Jewish religion today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, those who reject Jesus as Messiah, regardless of your heritage, whether you're Gentile, Jewish, or regardless of what it is, if you reject Jesus, then you have rejected the promised Messiah. And the Jewish people today, there are some who believe in Christ as Messiah, but as a whole, meaning the majority of Jewish people today, do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. I was thinking earlier... Uh, before Bethany even got here, but I was thinking of some of the some of these themes that God's intent is to bless all nations. Pastor Don was also speaking, which was correct, that there, neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. So the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Okay, now, the critics of Christianity uh, criticize Christianity because they say Christianity causes divisions. Christianity is exclusive, meaning Christians say there's only one way to God, which is true. 
But here's the contradiction that the critics make. Some are what we refer to as pluralistic. I'm not pluralistic. Pluralism is sort of the idea that all religions lead to God. Now, many that are critical of Christianity, I noticed that they're not critical of many of the other groups. There are other groups that are also exclusive, meaning they're saying there's one way to God. But the message of Christianity is really inclusive, okay? The critics are getting it wrong. But it's inclusive because God says, my son paid the price for the sins of all humanity. That's inclusive. But if you want to come and have the benefits of redemption, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's where the critics have a difficulty. They're saying, well, say if we want to worship God in our own way. Well, God has made the offer available to all people. And if people ultimately don't want to repent, then they don't believe. And if they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, they don't have that benefit. But what about, what do the critics say? Some critics say, and here's where they're a little in contradiction. Some say the answer, therefore, is pluralism, meaning the answer is all of them, let's say all of them are right. Some say that. Some say there are many paths to God, okay? I don't say that. But some say there are many paths to God, I'm sure. But those people, in their own thinking at times, are also, quote, ex exclusive because what they say is, we should be open to everybody, regardless of what their beliefs are, regardless of how they believe. And most of the people that say that are highly critical of Christianity. They degrade it, they talk bad about it constantly. Some of those critics are unfamiliar with. And if you were to ask them, okay, what is your belief then? You, you, you're critical of the church and Christianity because we say the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And what is your answer? And they would often respond and say, our answer is we're open to all belief systems and all religious systems, and therefore our answer is we're open-minded. But then I would ask them, but are you open to Christianity? And they would often say, no. They'd say, we're not open to Christianity because Christianity claims that there's only one way to God through Jesus Christ. And I would say, but I thought you just said your view is open to everyone. Correct? But why are you not open to Christianity? Oh, no. Oh, now I'm open to... No, you're not. You're excluding any other group, supposedly, that says we have the one claim to truth. But there are other groups out there that also claim, Islam being one of them, you're open to Islam. Many of those critics are open to Islam. Mm -hmm. They say, well, oh, yes, I'm open to Islam. They're also exclusive. As a matter of fact, your claim of openness, which is a pluralistic claim, that's also exclusive. That's where the contradiction is. This is apologetics. Because pluralism says, if we just accept them all, I say, okay, well, pluralism is saying that you're not going to exclude anybody. That's exclusive. Your claim is exclusive because the only view you accept is one. It's called pluralism. So you're exclusive yourself. This is just, I did a little apologetics there. But we, little we do claim that Jesus, as Christians, is the only way to God. And a verse, uh, I'll quote it now. Uh, some from John, Pastor Don spoke on. In John's Gospel, it talks about Jesus in John chapter 1. It says, The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. John 1 and John 3. But because their deeds were evil, they would not come to the light. And it says, But Jesus lights, lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Remember when I taught about the Logos, meaning... Everything is created by God's word. So all that's in existence came from Christ. Okay, God spoke the word and everything came into existence. So God himself, through Christ, created all humanity, created everything. 
It's not exclusive if you understand that all life came from him. And if in this journey that we're at on earth, we're trying to get back to the original uh, purpose of man, to glorify God, to be in relationship with God, God is redeeming everything back to himself. And so if everything came from Christ, it's coming back to the Father, also to Christ. Redemption also encompasses the creation, the universe. Okay, Romans teaches that, that everything is coming back. And so the problem is not that Christians are close-minded or that Christians... You have to accept at some point, and most everyone's accepting certain things at certain points of their journey. And if you want to say, but I reject that aspect, uh, I'm open to other religion, I'm open to that, but I reject that particular aspect. The scripture says the main reason it's rejected is because they don't want to come to the light. That's the main reason. And the one little meditation I had before Bethany got here and I started speaking today was... I was thinking about how the people of Jesus' day, those who were religious, the Pharisees, when they began to reject him, and Jesus at one point says, "Why? what wrong thing did I do? What wrong thing did I speak? I, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It says, because God was with him. That's from the book of Acts. It's Peter, actually. And they developed in their mind a hatred towards him because he was exposing their sin. He was exposing darkness. And even there, though there was not one bad thing he did, never sinned, and he was only doing good, once they developed that particular animosity, it would make no difference whether they were right or wrong. In their mind, they already were developing this hatred. And it was based on the fact that they said, well, he claims to be the son of God. But in their own religion, that may be built up with this today, in their own religion, which is Judaism, the prophets said, there's one coming. There's a Messiah coming. They were all waiting for one. Well, when he came in the first century, Jesus Christ, and was doing everything the prophets said he would do, once they in their minds formed this hatred towards him. There was like no way for the sin, darkness blinded their minds. But there were a few at that time, Nicodemus being one, that began questioning and saying, wait a minute, we've been teaching the Old Testament, we've been waiting for the Messiah, we all knew he was coming. And some began thinking in the religious Pharisees, they began saying, maybe it is him. And later some did believe. But once they developed that animosity, and this is what we see when I watch the whole spectrum of what's going on now without getting too political, we in our country, we, we develop various viewpoints right now. I'm, I'm very upset watching the world news, though I like to watch it, because the main story, top story, and there are other really tragic things that should be covered, but the top story is all political. It's how Donald Trump is not accepting, this is top story every night, top story. He's not accepting the intelligence agencies about the Russian interference of hacking. Okay. John, isn't, it, isn't the Russians who hacked the DNC? Understand, the DNC was not a government agency. It's a political arm of the Democrats. The Russians actually in the past hacked government agencies. Do you know what we did when we hacked uh, Iran's nuclear centrifuges and a very famous virus called the Suxnet, Suxnet virus? It's a few years ago. The United States went in and we did in Iran, this a few years ago, into their nuclear centrifuges. And we, we did a uh, virus that caused the centrifuges to burn up. We destroyed. We hacked and destroyed the nuclear program of Iran. Now, whether you afford the destruction or whatever, things have changed since then. And the way we did it, I thought that was interesting. I said, how did we hack it to destroy it, the hardware? It was a virus that showed false because those things run at certain temperatures, certain uh, mm -hmm. centrifuga, and mm -hmm. went in and hacked. And, and Told the code to Correct. 
And now, all countries are doing this, and they're hacking other official government things. Russia has hacked official government things. But in this hacking, it was the Democratic arm, which one of the guys by the name of John Podesta, his password was what? Password. That was his password. It wasn't hard to hack. But this has now become top, top. We're developing an entire, the media is now at the point of developing an entire, some in the public said, John McCain asked, is this a reason for us to actually go to war? War with Russia. Some are publicly saying that. We're raising something to a level because of all types of stuff that goes on in this country. And I, I just watch it, but I don't want to get off course. But I said it how once the people developed, we're going to, we do not like a particular viewpoint or a particular thing. Very rarely do they then, then change once they take a position. And it takes openness to be open to the message of the gospel or to be open to even hearing different points of view. Now, as Christians, when I debate, in my apologetics things, and I cover what the atheist arguments are and all. Oftentimes, look, if you do it right and you do it long enough, I believe that the intellectual, intellectual argument sides with the church. The church has had many intellectuals who have argued for the existence of God from creation, from science, okay, many. But you will very rarely convince an atheist if he thinks he's an intellectual hawking or whoever, you very rarely will convince them because then it's a matter of pride, okay? And then and people today, uh, some in the common understanding of things are accepting things that are absolutely scientifically false, but they've come to a belief. You're talking about evolution? No, I'm talking about the reality that old things that exist could not have come from nothing. You say, we don't... The average atheist actually believes that. The average atheist believes that everything, because there was a beginning point to all things, the average one believes everything came from nothing. That's impossible. That is scientifically impossible. It's a violation of laws of logic and science. But they're not aware of that. Okay? There has to be a cause for an effect. But why are they embracing these things? They're embracing these things because uh, there's a rejection. Oh. Did I say something Bill talked about? There was just, he, I don't know where he, um, Pastor Bill found this part at, but he said the Old Testament contains over 300 references to the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Computations using science of probability on just eight of those prophecies show that the chance that someone could fulfill all eight prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. Yeah. So... You know, that people will argue, oh, it was a conspiracy, they planted Jesus, oh, da, da, yes. da, da, da. but it was like, how does he, how did Jesus control where he was born? Or how yes. did, you know, all these things. Correct. And I've heard some of the critics try to explain and, and say, this is how yeah. these certain things can happen. Oh, okay. But in the end, um, I'm going through another course right now. And that, it's a course I took a long time ago. And it's the man later in the course, he's a one of the top professors in one of the universities that I order, it's called Great Courses, and they're actually CDs. But during the day when I'm working, uh, cleaning, working around the house, I try to listen to stuff like that. And uh, just on the most recent one, and I've heard him before, and he's an intelligent man, and the course he's doing is just on uh, not so much philosophy, but he's covering the Western intellectual tradition. And he's an educated man. He's supposed to be a top professor. And then he just got into Aristotle. And I remember him yesterday talking about the philosophers. And he said how Aristotle did not espouse God or believe in God in his philosophy. And I thought, how could he have gotten that wrong? You say, well, John, you just think. No, no. One of the big debates within the field of thinkers is, quote, Aristotle's God. Meaning, Aristotle spoke about and mentioned God. And the reason that's a big debate within Christian circles is Aristotle's God is not completely understood as the Christian God, but that's why the debate rages. He believed and spoke of God, Aristotle, but he didn't speak 
of God in the exact manner that the later Christians would. But I was so shocked to hear this professor say that Aristotle did not mention or base any of his philosophy on God. And I thought, even if you're an atheist, you can't say that. But this man was educated. He's, look, he's a professor, and I've heard the course before. And I thought, how you, people could make mistakes and all, but look, if that's what you're teaching, the Western intellectual tradition, and you got that wrong, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but now you either way, stuff. either yeah. way, um, okay, reading a couple more verses. This is more of an apologetics. He did a lot of um, other things, not out of the Bible. Okay, here's Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is, but you, O Bethlehem, Eph uh, Ephrathah. Ephrathah, out of thee are, are the least, and out of thee shall he come forth who shall be ruler or governor. Something like that. That might be another. He used, don't use King James, Bill. Right. Read it. The NLT. Okay, it says, are only a small village among the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. Yes, that's again that's tying right. in like he just tied he like spent a lot of time tying in those prophecies about where Jesus was coming from yes and thou and and Christ come came from a place that you could almost say was on the wrong side of the tracks in the sense of it wasn't considered the high class and all and that was another uh, stumbling block because how could it, it the intellectuals or the religious teachers of the day, like how could they be receiving this ragtag team of followers that he gathered mm -hmm. around him and all? But yet when he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and read it, it this famous reading of Jesus entering into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and then he opens up the scroll and he reads the prophecy about himself. And then he closes the scroll and says, this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? And it says the eyes of all the people were fastened on him. And he began revealing that these prophecies were about him. And, uh, th and that's why they were saying, even about the disciples, how did they know these things having never learned? See, they did learn, but they didn't have the certifications, if you will, of the Pharisees. And all. So that was another stumbling block that... How he, and Jesus would say, except you be converted and become like little children, you in no wise enter the kingdom. So the stumbling block had to do with humbling themselves and saying, okay, Jesus is the chosen one. He is the chosen one. And, and in the mind of sinful man, and that's a stumbling block. And particularly at that time, some of my street friends, it's interesting, Crow has mentioned this, and it's insightful. He said, you know, John, I... I'm glad I wasn't living at the time of Christ. He said, because it would be so much harder for me to have believed because most of us in the day we live, if somebody shows up and says, oh, I'm the one, most of us immediately are like, who does he think Crazy. he is? Mm -hmm. and, and so my friend Crow, and it's an insight that's true. Somebody else brought that up too. He said, it seems like I would be less willing to have believed because the natural thing in us. And we wouldn't have tied it all together. I think now we get this hindsight. We can yes. look back. Yes, blessed. The one of the other, mm -hmm. Melissa, who used to be a girlfriend of Crow, she said, John, I talked to her a few weeks ago at Timmins, and she watched the whole Gospel of John on TV, and uh, she said, John, that one verse, it stuck with me. It's uh, Jesus talking to Thomas, because Thomas was the doubting disciple. Jesus says, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and believed. And she said, wow, we are more blessed because, I said, yes, that's a famous verse. I'll quote one from, I'll tie it together here. A lot of these prophecies, of course, they were given in the Jewish Bible, which is the Old Testament. They were all contained in there. But, and Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies, but they were not seeing it all clearly. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he met two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus once, they, after the resurrection of Jesus, he had the capability to, quote, disguise himself, or where people, when they ran into him after the resurrection, we have in the New Testament, it says there were more than 500 witnesses 
who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. But sometimes when he'd appear to them, because he was in a glorified body, they would not know it was him, or they would mistake him. And so he's walking once, and there are these two disciples on the Emmaus Road, and they're kind of like sad. And he, Jesus is pierced to them and says, why are you so sad? They don't know it's him. And they said, haven't you heard what happened? Are you new in town? We were uh, followers of Jesus, and then they crucified him, and everything's in their minds. It's all falling apart, and this is, I think they said, this is the third day, and uh, uh, don't you understand? And Jesus, even when they asked him that, he said, what things? And then they were going explaining it. Well, then they were going a little further, and Jesus was going to go on, and then these two disciples of his said, not knowing it's him, said, no, come home with us. Now, there's a verse in Hebrews that says, do not be forgetful to entertain strangers, because some have entertained angels unawares. So that verse is saying, you don't know if there's a messenger in that, quote, homeless person, or you don't know if it's an angel. And in this case, they didn't know it was actually Jesus. Then when he sat with them, I believe it's when he broke the bread, then their eyes were open, and then he, he began to explain to them. They knew it was him, and he expounded unto them all things about him that were written in the scriptures. So he was showing them things that we do not even have in the New Testament. He had a personal Bible study with those guys and said, I'm going to show you how this is all revealed. I'll quote one from Don because uh, he talked about hope in Hebrews, Pastor Don. And the one from Hebrews was Hebrews 6, which I did a whole thing on Hebrews. But it says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and that which entereth behind the veil. All the imagery, the veil, which was covering the Ark of the Covenant, was where the presence of God was in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, which I taught recently. But that verse was saying, what Jesus has done for us, that gets us into the, that's how we're in the presence of God. We're anchored to the presence of God now permanently because of what Jesus did for us. And all of the verses and the prophets and all these prophecies, they were all pointing to that period of time when Christ came, died, was buried, and rose again as the fulfillment of it all. And if, if people outside of Christianity, if they want to benefit from what God has made available, some people say, but that's just, you know, God's not fair, or God's mean, or if God says, look, I did, I incarnated, meaning I became a man and died for all of you and, and before all people, and if that's not enough, and you're just so offended that I did that, you know, what more could I do, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's not that Christians are bigoted or there's one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And that does not mean that in society we need to, there's a lot of divisions in the world. And I'm grateful for any Muslims that get to look at my websites and all. And in the past, we had different ones. I'm grateful for Jewish friends and for all types of... And to have the conversation is good to have. And, and are there good elements in the other religions? The good elements that we find, whether it's in the Eastern religions, the elements of uh, maybe caring for your brother, and I tried to teach that in the past, the good elements in the other religions. Because there are some good elements in other religions. Because truth and treating each other rightfully in various morals that we see in other groups, in other uh, non-Christian groups, we should never say a good thing is bad, okay? We don't agree that that's the way to get to God through your own works, but we want to see if there are good things. And I think it would be good for Christians to sit down and have conversations with people of other faiths. And that doesn't mean we're denying our faith if we're uh, 
Jesus said, if you love those that love you, what thank have you? Even the publican, e even a anybody is friendly to those who have common things in common. But what about your enemy? How do you treat your enemy or those who have opposing views? It says, if you love them, then you've gone an extra mile. And I think oftentimes in the whole debate that we have in society, it's not so much uh, just making the argument. It's they're going to see it through us. They're going to see it by Jesus in John 17, by this shall all men know that you my disciples when you have loved one for another. And that extends to the other community out there, okay? I just gave you the verse. You don't just love those that love you. You're going to love your enemy too. And in the end, I think the church, when we display that love, you see, the death of Christ, he died. And so now he calls us also to live that sacrificial life. And I think that's a big part of how we are going to convince the other religious groups and for them to take that look, to take that second look. Okay, any other verses at the end, Bethany? I know we talked a lot today. I quoted that Hebrews 1. Just that, that I remember Pastor Bill talking about how uh, a lot of the other religions and laws even are based off the Old Testament. Oh, yes, yes. So every, there's the, a lot it, of things that are based off of that. If so you did... Except for that... Well, not, it, this is what we do when, we, when I do what we call apologetics. You do it from science, you do it from natural creation, but you also do it from the whole concept of conscience and what we refer to as natural law. And natural law is simply the, the debate within the whole idea of where did we get this whole concept of law. And I know most people say, well, John, societies know there are certain, that's correct. But if you actually say, but where does that come from? And natural law, the whole court system, foundational law, does indeed come from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the system that we understand. And societies in general, this is what the philosophers came up with, uh, Manuel Kant, I believe, when they were debating in the great uh, times of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution and the advancement of man, in the 20th century, uh, there was, amongst many thinkers, there was what you call the uh, secular, secularist thesis, thesis, where they were saying, oh, we're going to advance, where there will be no need for God or religion or anything. Uh, Nietzsche and others, Nietzsche uh, is criticized, rightfully so, for a very famous comment that sparked what we refer to as the death of God movement. Okay, Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the thinkers who was atheist, but it's interesting if you looked at some more of Nietzsche's writings, but th those words, the death of God, came from Nietzsche, but it came from a character of Nietzsche's which was the madman, okay? And he put those words in that character of the uh, he was writing. And what that madman was saying when he said, this is the death of God, what's going to happen to all foundations? It was actually a criticism of all of the thinkers that were beginning to say, also like Nietzsche, that if we think we're going to advance to where there is no more God, and in, in the character of Nietzsche, who is the madman, he says, you have removed the foundation of everything. And so you had thinkers like Immanuel Kant and others who said, wait a minute, whether or not we can truly prove God or not from reason and logic and so forth, Kant says, whether we can prove it or not, without the belief in an ultimate judgment, an ultimate if, you, if society goes off its rails, it's going to be payment to pay. He said, where are we going to have any natural law, moral law? Could it just be based solely upon popular opinion and all? So the thinkers began debating this and saying, and Nietzsche's man band, the same thing, said, if you, if you truly embrace the idea, and some, uh, I think it was Freud, said, we just got to, buck up and live up to the reality that this, this philosophy is called nihilism. Okay? John Paul Sartre, uh, Camus, and others were, who were atheists and philosophers. If you say to man, you are, there's actually, you had no, 
purpose. You're just an accident. Okay. There's no end. We call that teleology, but there's no end. There's no purpose. There's no design. If you put that in humanity, what is going to prevent anarchy? Mm -hmm. Total anarchy. If nothing really matters, in the end, you don't matter. And so that's what the thinkers were, a lot of them were debating. And how are we going to have society function if there's actually no idea of law? And where are we going to get that from? So uh, the critics, uh, there have been thinkers who have debated these issues for centuries. And many of the most prominent atheists today, men like Sam Harris and others who Look, they, they have arguments, and we should listen to some of their arguments, but they're not as, uh, they haven't really gone through all these questions like the thinkers were doing for a very long time now. And so it's not so simplistic uh, where those that think, well, let's just have a society where it's hedonism. Let's just let everybody do what they want to do. Look, you can't. Society doesn't run that way. And there's got to be a moral foundation to that. And one of the proofs of God is the fact that man has conscience. And if you say, I'm going to legalize uh, you going out and murdering. Let, let's have a society that it's legal for you to go murder. Mm -hmm. And then you go down the street and just kill somebody. You still are going to have a conscience, that a, a guilt that you did wrong. If you took vengeance and went and killed. And no matter what man says about that act, where does that guilt come from? It, it comes from because you were created in the image of God, and God put a conscience in you. So that's the Never argument. Thought of that. yeah. Yes, that's the argument uh, Paul makes in Romans. Actually, the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. That uh, that's one of the arguments mm -hmm. we get that from. A lot of women that they go out and they they get an abortion. And Later on, and and abortion. when I deal with the abortion issue, I don't want to put guilt mm -hmm. on women. Yeah. I think a lot in our society. They a lot in our society, uh, it's just, it's, it's progressed to the stage where it's bad at this point where we cannot recognize that even in the third trimester, uh, uh, science shows us that it's alive now, and we're still looking upon it in like it's nothing. And so uh, more, we would traumatize less women if we understood that it shouldn't be so done so freely as sort of like a birth control method, mm -hmm. that it, it's something that, and because many in the Planned Parenthood movements kind of celebrate it, like, oh, you got one, and that there's almost no discouragement. There's been testimonies of ladies that said that. They went into Planned Parenthood, and they said, I don't know what to do. And they said, oh, you know, an abortion is like you celebrate it. Mm -hmm. It's a right to be celebrated. Sweetheart, don't feel bad about it. And some of those women gave testimonies that after they saw their baby, and some were traumatic. They had yes. some didn't had no idea. They that were convinced that it was not really, you know. And then they saw a baby, and the, so that's that's not helpful to kind of cover it up. It, there was it's, this it's helpful bad to doctor tell them. that would lie about how far along these girls were. Yeah, and the mamas were taking the girls in. The young 15, 16 year old girl, not even telling the little girl truly how far along she was. Yes, and they would force them into this yes. abortion. I was like, oh my. Okay, we're going to end anyway. today. We went long. So uh, we covered some verses, a lot of different subjects. Um, I'll just pray a blessing on you guys, and then I'll add the verses and some of my different teachings in the past. Father, I thank you for uh, letting us have the discussion today. And most of all, God, uh, the Scripture also says that people that do not believe, that the Satan blind, blinds their eyes, that they can't see. So what we pray is for the power of God to break blindness off of people, that they could see the light of the glorious gospel that Paul talked about, that as the light shined in darkness, so the light of the gospel of Christ, Jesus shines into our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So we pray that you would open blind eyes, break blinders off of people, and just bless people. And even those that are from the other religions, uh, that they'd still be welcome at this table and to learn and to watch videos and all different types of things, but that they would also come to truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.